The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real. And by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, so we're super excited today to have Matthias J. Sachs, who's a software engineer at Confluent. Uh, Matthias is going to talk to us about, about KSQL DB, which is their, their data, relational database built on top of Kafka. Uh, Matthias has been at Confluent working on uh, Kafka and Kafka later projects since uh, 2016. Um, prior to that, he got his PhD at Humboldt University, where he studied distributed stream processing systems, which is perfect to work on Kafka, right? So uh, we'll do like we normally do, we'll, we'll organize this like we normally would. If you have any questions, uh, please unmute yourself at any time, interrupt Matthias, because we want this to be uh, interactive. But say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask your question. OK? All right, Matthias, the floor is yours. Go for it. OK. Thank you very much for the introduction, Andy. Um, very happy to be here and have the opportunity to speak about KSQL DB. Um, so, so I call it a stream relational database system. What uh, I have to confess might be a little bit of a stretch. I tried to have a kind of a catchy title. Um, it's also kind of unclear what a stream relational database system I think actually should be. And well, I will, will try to give you our take on this and we'll explain what we have built so far and what, what ideas we have in mind for, for, for future development. So, so maybe, maybe start with kind of, you know, what, what should this actually be? So we also call, call KSQL to be a, a streaming database. And so, so the idea of, of a streaming database in, 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 our, in our mind is to have a, a SQL abstraction over mutable tables and immutable append-only streams. So, so what, what does this actually mean? So if you, if you compare to, to like traditional databases, relational databases, um, they have two main use cases. You have, you have OLTP use cases where you have a lot of transactions modifying your state and concurrent updates and you need to make sure everything is consistent. And on the other hand, you have, you have, you have OLAP where you have those complex ad hoc queries uh, for analytics. And, and KSQL DB is, is not built for any of those use cases. So, so KSQL DB um, is, uh, is built for, for use cases that you could call online stream processing. I've heard other people using this term, so maybe we can establish a, a new OLSP uh, category here. Let's see. And, and so the idea is really to say, well, um, we, we want to work over streams and tables, but we, we really focus on continuous queries. So in, in, in regular databases, you issue a query, the query is protected via asset guarantees and basically works against the snapshot of the database. Uh, here, continuous queries, it's kind of, no, we know that tables are changing over time, they're evolving, and we have those streams where always new data comes in and we want to continuously process this. Um, so for KSQL DB, besides those continuous queries, we also allow actual lookup queries into tables. Um, so this is similar to, to classic queries that, that you know of. However, in KSQL DB, it, it's very limited. Um, we have only simple state lookup, and I will explain this a little bit later more detail. Um, and then we have a third type of a query um, that allows you to, to subscribe to a data stream. So when you're a client and you connect to the database, you can just say, I want to subscribe to this data stream. And whenever new data is appended to this data stream, it's just send it to the client in a continuous manner. Um, and so two main use cases we, we have seen so far that people are using is this kind of streaming ETL, where you, you might have some, some upstream uh, producer um, that is publishing data. Uh, so you want to, you know, transform this data and then eventually maybe land it into a data warehouse um, for then ad hoc OLAP queries, while um, KSQL DB is really just doing this, the streaming ETL part. Um, and the other one is, is materialist view maintenance. So you can basically say, I, I have my query and my query computes a table as a result. And I want to have this table continuously updated while new data is, is arriving into the system. Um, and then I want to do like those simple lookups into the materialized view from my client. Uh, and well, if you do this in a, in a streaming fashion, then of course you get very uh, low latency updates to your materialized view. And that is exactly one of the, the sweet spots of, of KSQL DB. Um, so before we go into many details of KSQL DB, maybe first a clarification, as Andy said already, KSQL DB is built uh, for Apache Kafka, so it only works with Apache Kafka. It's not a standalone system. And so there's a high-level architecture is really said we have, we have two clusters of servers. So on the one hand, we have the, the broker cluster, that is Kafka. Uh, and the broker cluster 
can be considered the storage layer of the system. And then we have a, a cluster of KSQL DB servers um, where we do the actual computation. Uh, and both clusters uh, communicate over network. So it's kind of decoupled. You can also scale both clusters independently. Um, and because everything is built on, on Apache Kafka, uh, some things from Apache Kafka is something we've inherited in KSQL DB in our design. And uh, for that reason, I would like to go a little bit into background of Apache Kafka, what it actually does and how it works, um, to, to allow us to understand how KSQL DB uh, works that is, that is built on top of it. So if you, if you look at Kafka as, as a storage system, um, the first thing you have to understand is what does Kafka actually store? And in Kafka, um, we, store, we store logs. Um, logs are, are append-only sequences or sequences of messages. Um, and so we, we have this logical abstraction, what we call a topic. Um, and topics are first partitioned. And so every partition is a log by itself, you can say. Um, and because it's an append-only log, well, if you, if you write new messages, you always append to the end of the log or to the, to the tail. Um, so it's a very, very simple thing. Nothing can be updated. And when you, when you read from the log, then usually you do a scan over a partition or multiple partitions or multiple topics. Um, so from old records with like lower sequence number, here indicated with the numbers we call those offsets, um, to, to higher sequence numbers. Um, the main difference to a to regular like messaging system in Kafka is really that, that those logs are persistent and replicated. Um, and that allows clients to also say at some point in time, actually would like to go back in time and read old messages. As long as they are stored and it's configurable, um, you can do this. Um, so, but, but so the main access pattern is really linear scans over the partitions. That is kind of important. So there's not really random lookups here. Um, so this is actually a quite, quite simple model. So now this question is, well, we, we store those messages. Um, what are those actually? And so Kafka is, is really a very primitive system with this regard because messages are just plain bytes to Kafka. So it, it uses the key value model. So it has this kind of two components in the message, but it doesn't really know what is stored in there. Um, so when, when a client is, is writing something into a Kafka topic or appending something, it has to serialize the data client side, and then it just sends over the bytes and Kafka just puts into the log and it's done with it. Um, the advantage of this is that Kafka is very high performant because it doesn't need to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, and that makes it very, very, very scalable. Um, so the key value model is, is important because the key is usually uh, used for partitioning. So um, even if the client decides in which partition uh, a particular message is written, it usually uses the key to compute, let's say, a hash or does a range partitioning to pick a partition and write it to it. Um, and we will see that this becomes, becomes very important, this notion of a key for, for some applications. Um, and then besides key and value, we also have an associated timestamp with every message. It's also important for stream processing because here we want to do temporal processing and consider the timestamp when the message was actually uh, written or actually when the producer is setting the timestamp, not the broker. So um, this is also becomes important. Um, then the other important thing is, well, those logs are append only, as I said. So if you cannot delete anything, well, it would grow unbounded. That's something we don't want to have, obviously. Uh, and so topics have a so-called cleanup policy that allows you to actually uh, get rid of old data you're not interested anymore in the topics. And there are two policies here. So the first one is a, is a retention policy. And it just tells you, well, when you append new data to the topic, it's a tail. At some point, old messages are ready to be purged. So we're not interested in this anymore. And the, the retention policy here is either time-based or size-based. So you can say, store data for the last month or for the last day. Or you can say, oh, store whatever, a gigabyte per partition or something like that. Um, and then that's retention policies is quite straightforward. So, 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 so other ones, the compaction policy is actually much more interesting. Uh, and here now the key value model also comes into play. So when, when you configure a topic as, as compaction, um, you basically want to apply some kind of update semantics to your data. 
where you would say, well, I, I treat the key of the message as kind of the primary key, if you wish. And every time I write a message with the same key, I consider it to be an update to the old message. And then the compaction uh, policy allows that old or older versions for the same message with the same key uh, can, can be deleted from the log. So in this case, we have this example where we have five records with keys and values, so the keys and the letters. And we see that we have, we have three records for, for message A. And so when, when compaction runs, compaction is allowed to delete the first two and only keep the latest one. Um, that also implies that if you, if you put a record into the topic and, and you never touch it again, or you never write another record with the same key, it will stay there forever. So that's also important. So it would never lose data uh, or lose state for a particular, for a particular entity. Um, and what you can also do here is you can also delete stuff. So there you, we have so-called tombstone messages where we say, well, if you write a message with a particular key and you set the value to null, then we just really just delete and then we can, uh, can, can delete the entry from the topic entirely. And well, as database people, you know, this log compaction looks actually pretty, pretty neat. Um, and what it, what it allows us to do is, is, is to talk about uh, what we call the stream table duality. So if you, if you have a table and you modify the table, then, well, you can record all those changes in a so-called change log. And then you can reuse this change log to actually recreate the table. Um, so here on the left-hand side, we have an input table and we say, well, we do an insert with Alice. That is something we could record with Alice as the key. And you just say, well, we have seen Alice once. We just do a count here. So then we have a Charlie, we append it to the table. And now we do an update from Alice from one to two. So in this case, in the change log topic, we just append a new record, Alice two here, uh, and so forth. And now when we reread this, we can, you know, uh, turn the change log back into a table um, and recreate the table state. And the interesting part is here, if, if you're only interested in the, in the latest version of the table, in this case on the very bottom right, uh, and we run compaction on this change log stream, even if we delete the first record, Alice one, we can still recreate the table. So the topic compaction really gives us this property. If something is not updated, we never delete it. But if it's updated, we can purge old state and old versions of the table. We are not interested in this anymore. Um, and, and this is a very important concept that is used in, in Kafka streams um, and KSQL DB um, a lot. Um, so, so just keep it in mind. And it's all really based on this, on this key value model and, and update semantics. So, now, when we, when, we, when we go now a level higher in KSQL DB, uh, I mentioned already, we, we want to talk about streams and tables here. And while a table is very similar to a database, um, we have to create table statement. Um, we define our schema, so all records are very uh, structured. And we, 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 uh, rec uh, we, we require that all records follow the same schema, like, like in a regular database. Um, the main difference here is really that we have this with clause um, where we say, well, where is the data actually stored? And this refers to a Kafka topic here, because that's the storage layer. Um, and we also have here the notion of the primary key again, uh, the user ID. And in this case, this tells us that this attribute, the user ID, will be stored in the key of the message, while all the other attributes are stored in the value. Um, so far, so good. Uh, and now in addition to, to tables, what we also allow people to do is to say, well, I actually want to create a, a stream, an event stream um, over a Kafka topic. Similar, we have um, all those attributes, it's structured. Um, we use the uh, regular database types that are available. Um, and, but, but now we basically say, well, we have the same data and we have data in a Kafka topic. And so creating a stream or a table basically gives us a different semantic interpretation of this, of this data. And usually when you, when you go back to the retention policies we just explained, then usually if you have a data stream, you configure the topic with, with retention time. Uh, and if you have a table, you usually configure it with compaction. So there's kind of this, this alignment to those configurations. Um, why, why, why does that matter when you're actually declaring the, the table or the stream? Like, well, it doesn't matter. It's just like what you, what you should keep in mind how the system works. And um, okay. very often the topics are actually already exists. 
Um, so that is kind of similar to, to what Hive would doing. You know, you have, um, you have an HDFS with some data in it and you create a table over some things that already exists. So we create streams and tables over topics that already exist in the Kafka cluster. Does that make sense? But, but, so, 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 so like, what, what changes if I say I want a stream versus, a, versus a, like create table versus create stream? What, what changes in like the, the query API? Is it just, or is it just like the underlying semantics of what, like how things will be computed? Well, queries over streams and tables are executed quite differently. Okay. So you get different operator semantics for sure. Okay. Um, we, we, we can see this later. Okay. Um, okay. Because as I said, when you, when you have a table, you actually say every record with the same key should be an update to a previous one. While in a stream, you treat everything as an append only sequence, there's no updates. But like, how are you expecting things to get updated? Like things are getting updated through the Kafka API or are they getting updated through KSQL DB? Um, so the, the most prominent use case in production is where, where some upstream application, and I have a slide on that later, okay. um, is actually uh, uh, appending new, new data to the topics. Okay. We also allow insert into statements, um, but they also work a little bit different. Okay, that's right. All right, sorry, keep, keep going. Yeah. Okay, so, so that is the data model. So we, we usually we assume we have existing topics and we want to process the data. So we say treat this topic as a stream or treat it as a table. Um, and now we, we, we issue queries um, and the, the, the bread and butter of KSQL DB is really those persistent continuous queries. Um, and well, they take one or multiple streams or tables as input and they compute the result stream or table. And now here actually the, the right path comes into play. So when, when this query is executed and we, we create a result stream or table, since the result is published back into a, top, into a topic in Kafka. Um, so we use this create stream and create table as select statements uh, to, to express this. So the select is really expressing your actual computation. Um, and then we just say create stream, create table to write it back into, into a Kafka topic. Um, and as I said, those queries then um, are deployed in the KSQL DB server and run then forever uh, until you would say drop stream or drop table. And then we can also terminate the corresponding query. Um, and what is now interesting because we are already in a, in a you know, data parallel system um, and I will explain more details later how this works. So those queries are executed uh, data parallel and that makes the whole system scalable and for tolerant. So you can always scale out queries um, and you can also, you know, scale out the cluster by adding, adding new compute nodes and we will just, just use them. And if any server goes down, say it's executing a query, then another server will take over and we, we will fail over. And I will explain a little bit later how this works in detail um, to, to make this happen. Um, so this is a persistent query and that is really the, 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 the main use case we see. However, we also support those, those transient queries. Um, so we have a regular CLI where you can interact with, with KSQL DB. Um, we also have a, have a Java client library. And there you can, you can either say, I, I want to deploy a persistent query into, into the, to the server, obviously, but you can also write those, those transient queries that we call pull queries and push queries. And a pull query is really uh, like a classic query. Um, so it's against a single table uh, and you can do state lookups and say, you know, give me the current value uh, of this row. Um, at the moment, it's very limited. We don't support aggregations or joins on purpose because um, if you want to have more complex aggregations, we would always say, well, uh, submit a, a persistent query to compute this output table so when you would say you want to query and then you would just do the light lookups into the table itself um, to, to actually query the state. Um, and then we have those, those push queries um, that I mentioned where you can say, I actually want to subscribe to result stream. Um, and that is something you can think of, well, as I said, you know, we, we, when, we, when we compute the result of, uh, of, of a query, we, we pipe it back into a Kafka topic. So you could basically say, well, I want to read this Kafka topic conceptually and get all those messages that are, that are altering my result. And I only issue this query once and it just runs forever and the, the results are just streamed to the client and the client doesn't do anything more about that. 
Um, uh, okay. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm Lin, I'm a PG student here. So I'm wondering, um, is, it, is there any fundamental reason that you cannot do aggregation or joins in uh, Qsql DB tables, or is it just uh, something that just has not, does not have enough need to, to support it yet? Uh, there's no fundamental reason. Um, it's really something that we, we don't really need at the moment. And we're also not sure if we will ever need it, uh, because that's not, not, not the use case we, we, really, we really optimize for. I see, I see, I see, thanks. Yeah. Um, and besides that, I mean, our current architecture, because we never optimized for it, would also make it very hard to do. Um, not impossible, but, um, and we will see, we will see later how, how that works. Right. So I, I, I don't know if you're going to talk about this. Like, what is, like, sounds like you don't have a query optimizer or, or you do have one or how should I, like? Not really at the moment. Um, okay. So we, we do some very simple optimizations like, like filter push down that is rule based and stuff like that. Um, but, in, but in general, query optimization, I will talk at, this, at the very end of the talk, is, is a very interesting topic for us yes. because we need to optimize basically those continuous queries that are deployed in the server. And then completely different questions are actually interesting than in a, in a relational database system. Um, and then, so also to like your, your SQL syntax is different because it's, well, no, no, I mean, the, the create stream versus create table, that, that's different, but like, the SQL itself, there's no semantics that are specific to KSQL DB, right? They are. They are. Oh, we'll okay. we'll, we'll see examples later on. Okay. All right. So, and then your your network interface, like the, the for the for the client, is that based on something else, or is that you know is that written from scratch for for Kafka for you for you guys? Like, did did you base it off of like you know HSQL DB or something like that? Um, so, so it depends now. So here for the, for the Java client library that is directly talking to the, to the, to the KSQL DB server, that is something we built from scratch. Got it, okay. Um, but of course, we have the communication from the KSQL DB servers to the Kafka brokers. And there is we just use the, 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 the Java clients that are shipping with, uh, with the Apache Kafka project. Got it. Okay, all right, thank you. So yeah. So, so, so the overall like high level overview of KSQL is usually something like that. You you do have the, the Kafka cluster that is storing topics that be then register in KSQL DB with those create stream and create table statements. Um, you have usually upstream applications that are you know writing in those topics, um, and then you have the KSQL DB cluster that is that is consuming them with those continuous queries and is publishing results back into the Kafka cluster. Uh, and in addition to that, while KSQL DB is executing those queries, well, it also accumulates state for tables. Um, and so this table state is then, then exposed via those, those, those pull queries, um, where you can say, you know, do a lookup into this table and give me the current value for this primary key. Um, or the application can say, I want to actually subscribe to a data stream and then the KSQL DB server is pushing out all those results automatically. Um, and because all those results are published back into the Kafka cluster, into topics again, um, there can also be downstream consumers usually um, that are consuming those topics for, for further processing. So, so going back to the, to the streaming ETL pipeline, we said, you know, um, you might have um, some, some upstream database where you do a CDC data capture, you know, have everything into Kafka, then use KSQL DB to crunch your data, to modify your data, write it back, and then you, you use uh, an, an, an another, another downstream consumer to pipe it into a data warehouse. That would be a, would be a classic, a classic KSQL DB application. Okay, so with, with this in mind, um, and Andy asked us this already, let, let's talk a little bit about, about querying. Um, so what we, what we try to do here is to say, well, if we, if we query tables, um, we want to behave like regular SQL. Um, however, one difference is really that we want to have temporal semantics. Um, so SQL also has temporal extensions and it's kind of going into this direction and there's some overlap. Um, and so all the temporal operators we have, say, should be, should be event time-based, uh, as I said, Every message in our Kafka topic stores this timestamp, uh, and we would always use this timestamp to apply our temporal operators um, to, to, to compute the result. And this allows us, of course, to, to build a deterministic system 
we, we would never use something like wall clock time because then you know everything would be non-deterministic. So if you if you think of a table, you really you really think to think of the table as as something that is changing over time, and conceptually you can associate kind of a version to a table for every time point in time. Um, and then of course, well, we have our streams, and now the question is, well, how do we how do we want to query streams? Um, and so let's start with with with, with a simple stateless query where we say we have you know filters and projections and that should be rather simple so let's assume we have our our click stream as an input and we say well we want to apply a filter uh, and on some user id here and then we project some field and we also call call a udf here um, and then we pipe the result into the click stream so what does it actually do well we have our, our click stream input and every time a new record is appended to the click streams, uh, then this record would be piped through this query. And if it passes the filter, well, we would apply the corresponding projections uh, and, and expressions and then create an output record and write it into the output stream. Um, that's rather straightforward, I would say. Um, but, but now the question is, well, if you have a stream and a stream is conceptually you know, infinite and unbounded, um, how can I actually aggregate a stream? And here we follow a little bit of a different approach than many other stream processing systems. So, so what we say is, well, if you, if you aggregate a stream, what you actually compute is a result table. And while we get new input data in the stream and process this input data, we are continuously updating the result table. Um, so here we have an example with uh, this account. So we have an input click stream. We have an additional filter here. We do a group by by user ID. So we want to count by user ID, uh, and we want to uh, want to count how many URLs this user did basically visit. And you can do this in a windowed fashion or non-windowed fashion. It doesn't really matter. Um, and the result will always be be this table the uh, that the like SQL DB server will store um, in the server itself. But all the changes to the table while we are executing this query will also be written out into a Kafka topic as the change log stream of the corresponding table. Um, and so you can think of this as when there's a, here there's, there's a grouping uh, attribute is the user ID. So basically the user ID becomes the primary key of the result table. Uh, and while new input records are coming in, we can just you know, update the corresponding row for this user in the table. While we, are, while, we are, while we are computing and updating and refining the result while new data comes in. And, and if you apply a window like here, so, and this is one of those extensions that is not standard SQL, we have this windowed tumbling clause. We say, well, actually we don't want to count for, for infinity. We, we always want to restart the count every 30 seconds and start at zero again and chunk the input stream in those windows. Um, and for this case, the table would basically create a new entry for this user every time we start a new window. Um, and that is quite, quite unusual because most stream processing systems, when they do an aggregation over a stream, the result is also a stream. Um, and then, of course, they always force you to have a windowed aggregation because otherwise they cannot do the computation at all. In our case, because we say the output is a, is, a, is a table that we continuously update while new data arrives, and we support windowed and non-windowed aggregations, um, and can both represent as a, as a, as a table, actually. What's a good example of like, where like, someone would want this choice? Like, I understand the windowed one. Like, um, like is, is a particular use case of like 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 an application would absolutely need both because you're deviating from this from the SQL standard. Yeah, I mean, as I said, the, 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 the window tumbling is is actually a non SQL standard clause, and that is what what people usually want to do, um, because they say, well, I have an aggregation, and I'm only interested in in in, in a certain amount of time. So let's say, um, if I if I do fraud detection. Let's say I'm only interested in the transactions for this user that are happening in the last hour. You know, everything else it doesn't really matter to detect fraud. Okay, so I, I thought the SQL standard had tumbling windows. This, this makes sense. No, it does not. It does not. Okay. Um, so, so the SQL standard has has a window clause. Well, it has has an over clause that is part of the select statement, 
But this, this window tumbling clause, that is, that is non-standard. Non that is something, something we added. And there's actually a big debate going on in the, in the community if this is the right approach. Um, other people have other ideas how a tumbling window could be represented without the need of the syntax. Um, but we think adding the syntax actually making the language easier. They've been debating this for 15 years, so it's not, it's not new. Sure, sure. Yeah. But so there is, there is actually an, an effort at the moment, and Confluent is also involved in that, to maybe define a streaming SQL standard. Um, so there's a lot of debate going on there. Again, like Stoneberger tried to do streaming SQL 10 years ago. I mean, you know, there's enough companies now, I think you guys can pull it off. So I, like, whereas before, there's only like Streambase and a few others. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, a, that's a big difference. I mean, yeah. in the last five to 10 years, stream processing become kind of mainstream. So now defining a standard becomes much more, you know, interesting. Before, if it's just academia, nobody really cares and then it's not going to happen anyway. Um, so, so let's see how far it goes. I mean, it's very early and maybe there will not be any standard. Who knows? That could also happen. Um, it's an interesting discussion, so. Is, it's, I, mean, I, I don't want to spend time talking about your competitors, but like for Spark streaming, is their syntax widely different than yours? Um, I'm not totally sure at the moment because I'm not very familiar with Spark streaming. Um, so I know that some systems, um, especially Flink, they're trying very hard to be SQL compliant. Um, where we say, well, we give us a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, and well, we, we prefer like a clearer, easier use syntax uh, in order, but then break compatibility to the standard because it's just, just better for users. Famous last words. <laughs> sure. We will yeah. see. Yeah, all right. Keep going, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, anyway, so, so I think this is uh, pretty interesting. So it's just those streaming aggregations are basically now producing a, a result table. Um, and, and always keep in mind that, that the result here is kind of, is kind of uh, a dual. So we have the actual state that we store in the KSQL DB server, and we also have, have the change log topic that we write into the Kafka topic. Um, so what you now also want to do, we want to want to joins. So if you have streams, how do you, how do you join streams? And well, because streams are conceptually unbounded and infinite, um, we need to we need to enforce users to apply a, a window here, a sliding window, to bound the join. Otherwise, we would need to buffer the whole history of the streams. That is something we cannot do, and this is also non-standard. So here we have added this within clause, where we say left stream join right stream within five minutes. So that means uh, records can be at maximum five minutes apart from each other, um, and then we have some join condition here um, to execute the join. So if we, if you look at an example here, we have two input streams, and here I, I basically only show the timestamps, uh, the numbers and letters are just for illustration to see the output result to you know give every record a unique identifier, um, and we we apply this time windows and here we can we would get three output records, so A is joining with one, so they are three minutes apart, falling within the window, and B and two is joining, so five minutes apart and so forth. Um, what is interesting, so, is uh, the last output record. So if you, if you pay close attention to the first up, uh, input stream and the timestamps, you see that the last record has a descending timestamp. Um, so because in Kafka topics, the timestamp is set by the producers, there's no guarantee that the records in a topic are ordered by timestamp. Um, so we call those records out of order records. And so the engine needs to take care to process those records correctly. So that's kind of important. Just want to mention this on the side. Um, and what we also need to do is, for this reason, we need to define precise operator semantics to compute uh, the, the timestamp for the output records. Because now I have two input records with two timestamps. And so the question is, what should be the timestamp of the output record? Um, and so what we do here, we define the semantics to always use the maximum of both inputs. So for this last result record, even if we might process the record three with timestamp 1408 later in wall clock time, then the B record, we would still give it the B record event timestamp. Um, and that gives us deterministic semantics. Um, and that's, that's, that's super important. 
Um, and you know, we had a lot of, lot of discussions internally how we, how we do those things. And now we have an agreement. We're not sure if it's uh, the right thing to do, but that is what we do. And we think it it's work, work, works great so far. I like this is so esoteric. I can't imagine any of your customers even knowing. Like, like. Well, I guess I, I guess many many customers don't know that. That's true. Yeah. But the point is still, if they issue a query, and they get a result back, and they issue the same query, yeah, they yeah. want the same result back. <laughs> course, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. They don't really care, but it must yeah. be deterministic. So, and and, re, uh, and and getting determinism in those streaming systems is not straightforward. So that is why I'm pointing it out. This is one of those, those things that is that is different because everything is temporal. Another thing that's interesting is is end weight joins, because well, if you want to join multiple streams, those joins are not associative anymore. So if you have a, have, a, have a proper end weight join over three input streams, it actually gives you a different result than if you use two binary joins and chain them together. Uh, and the other in interesting part is, you know, you have those multiple permutations, how you can do those binary joins, and all of them give a different result. Uh, so, so let's look at this, why this actually is. Um, so here again, now we have three input streams. We again assume the time window is, is five minutes. Uh, so in this case, we would get a single output result. So only two Y and B are joining. So they are within five minutes and fall into one, one join window here. Um, so if we now execute this join as a, as a binary join and just pick the first one as an example here, then we would say, well, we, we first join the first two input streams applying of the same window of five minutes and we get an intermediate result. In this case, we get three intermediate joint results. Um, and now as a second step, well, we would join the third input stream with our intermediate joint result. Again, applying the same five minute window. And what we can see now is that now we are getting two output records and not just one. Because the first one is new, the second one is the one that is also into the, in the first result. And, and the main reason is really how we set the output timestamp, what I explained before. So in the, in the intermediate results, the first output record gets timestamp 1406. So at this point, we are losing track of its original input record one in the very low, uh, top corner with 1401. Uh, and because we are losing track of this timestamp, we're now joining it with, uh, with the third input stream and produce a, a new output record. Um, so what, it, what is interesting so is that we, we know that all those permutations of binary joins produce a superset of the n-way join. Um, and if we basically would preserve the timestamp information, then we could also apply an additional filter uh, after the second join to actually filter them out. Uh, and, and this observation actually you know, gives us some opportunities for, for join optimizations. So we haven't implemented anything yet, just to you know, clarify that. But I hope that we can exploit this in the future because you know, if you join the re-optimizations, and, and, uh, then you can, can exploit those things. Um, but, but it's really important to understand, because of this time semantics, those joins are not associative anymore. And if you want to reorder them, then you need to play uh, more tricks in the optimization to make sure that you compute the right result. But again, I, I think this is one of those things that's so low level, I don't think your users would, would know. Maybe. Again, um, I guess, it, it, it depends really if, if you write a join, and at the moment we don't do any join reordering. So the user is specifying the join order for us, and they would write it differently, they get a different result. The users need to be aware of, you need to tell them at least, even if you don't do anything. I mean, that's also gonna make it super difficult to debug your optimizer because like, it's gonna depend on like what events are showing up and like the ordering of those events, not just what the data looks like. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't envy you. Talk. Yeah, I mean, with, with, with regard to query optimization, we are still in the very early phase. Um, but yeah, that's going to be exciting topics in the future for sure. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about table queries. I mean, table queries are kind of straightforward, but also not. Um, because you always need to keep in mind that, you know, we always consume a change of topic. And then we kind of maybe or maybe not materialize it into a store for processing. Um, and so, well, while we do have like regular SQL and everything should behave regular, regular SQL, it, it's still still slightly different because, as I said, you know, you you don't really query the table, 
what you actually do is you query the change log stream. And because we have those, those persistent queries that we deploy and that operate over the Kafka topics. And, and materializing something in an actual store in, in the KSQL DB server is either a, 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 necess a necessity to compute the query or it's just an optimization. But, but the semantics are really, really driven a little bit from the change log topic. Uh, but we, of course, we, we uh, try to, to align them with, with regular SQL semantics. Um, so when you, when you have a regular like filter or projection query, or even an aggregation over a table, then you can think of this like you have this input table, um, and this input table might be updated from the change log, and it's you know, evolving over time. And so the query is executing over those changes, uh, and producing an output stream, and then this output stream can be again materialized into a result table. So the result table kind of becomes a materialized view, actually, of the input table. And, and the query is running continuously in the background over the change log um, to, to, to update the materialized view result to keep it in sync with, uh, with the changes applied to the table. And here, of course, we try to, to have the exact same SQL semantics. So if you write a SQL query, the result table should be the same like in a database. Um, however, the execution is quite different because we operate over the change log stream. Another interesting thing here is now, if we, if we look into joins, so because we have streams and tables, we can also say actually, why not joining a stream to a table? Um, and the idea here is to say, you, you, have a, you have a stream that you want to enrich with data that is stored in a table. So if you, if you compare to like data warehouse use cases, very often you have, you have a fact table and then you have all your dimensions tables that join together. So we would actually say, well, that should be a fact stream and all your dimension, dimension tables around it. So for, for every record we are getting in the stream, we would do a lookup into the table to enrich it. So you can think, for example, you have credit card transactions and you want to say, you know, every time somebody makes a, makes a, makes a purchase, you, you look up the current uh, balance of the credit card, enrich the stream, and then later on make a decision if you approve or decline because, you know, you might be overdrawn or something like that. And at the same time, keep in mind that the table is not static. The table itself is always updating in the background as well while we're doing those lookups into, into the table. Um, and here again, temporal semantics comes, comes into play. Um, so let's assume we have, we have a change log stream on the very top that is updating our table. And in the bottom, we are having the event stream that is coming in that we want to join against the table. So now what we need to do is we need to, we need to interleave processing between both because we need to make sure that we, that we have the table with the right state when we do the join. The table should not be in the future of the record, but it should also not be in the past of the record. So, so while we are, we are interleaving here, we're always looking at the timestamps and we say, well, either we're updating the table or we're taking a stream record to do a lookup into the table. Because again, if you go back to the example of the credit card transaction, if, if I have two credit card transactions and the first one looks up the balance and the second one is looking up the balance an hour later, well, I need to look up a different balance. And if I reprocess the data, I always need to look up the same balance that was valid when the credit card transaction actually happened. So we need to make sure that the table is always in the right state. So we get real temporal semantics here. Um, so while we are processing the input stream here, and for example, you see that we, we are updating the, the, the first row in the very end uh, with A. Um, so we only have the primary keys, we update B uh, at some point. Then we always need to make sure that those lookups based on the event times uh, correlate to the corresponding table version. And this temporal semantics now uh, goes beyond stream table joins. We also apply them to table table joins. So when we have a table and we update those tables over time, we also want to make sure that we join tables with the content that is valid at the same point in time. So if we, if we have a table users and a table details and we join them together uh, and we compute a result, then um, we, so conceptually we want to join table at version one with, with the other table at version one. In this case here, if nothing changes, for example, for the user table, 
then of course the version two of the user table is the same as the version of one of the user table. So we can just join with the other one. And so we basically get, uh, get, get those three results for those input tables and those updates. Uh, and again, we need to make sure that we do this, do this correctly um, with regard to their, their temporal uh, properties. So it's like SQL, but always with time in mind. And again, if you run a query like this, while the user and detail tables are updated in the background, you would always you know, uh, update your profile table. Um, that is the join between those um, to maintain this relationship of inputs and outputs. Okay, um, now I would like to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the runtime and how this is actually implemented. This was all more about like semantic level so far. And so Kafka's uh, KSQL DB is, is using Kafka Streams as, as its runtime. So, so let's, let's look at what Kafka Streams actually is. Um, Kafka Streams is a, is a Java client library. It's, it's part of the Apache Kafka project. Um, and it allows you to write data flow programs over topics. And again, the topics here are represented at KStreams and KTables. And that corresponds to our streams and table abstraction we also use in KSQL DB. So the user can say, I want to, want to read a stream. And then we have all kinds of operators like map, filter, group by, window by, aggregation, join. And say, they change them together uh, to build their data flow program. And that is exactly what KSQL DB does. So we are getting a query, we are parsing the query, and then we are compiling it down into this data flow program, reusing the operators from the Kafka Streams runtime, um, then to actually deploy and execute the query. Um, and now all the scalability and fault tolerance uh, I mentioned before is actually coming from Kafka Streams. So Kafka Streams has also things built in, um, and KSQL DB relies just on Kafka Streams um, to get those, those properties. So, and first and foremost, I always talk about persistent queries here. So as I said, in Kafka Streams, when we have the, the DSL program, we compile it down into a data flow program, what we call a topology. So we have the operators that are uh, represented as nodes, and we have the data flow as edges. Um, and when we have this program, now we can, we can execute this. And now the, the parallel listen comes into play. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, Kafka topics are already partitioned. So and we, are, we are inheriting this partitioning of the Kafka topics in our, in our runtime. Um, so when we have a data flow program, we can instantiate it multiple times and then apply it to process the data of a single partition. And of course, very often we need to take care of like, you know, data co-partitioning and co-location and stuff like that, but, but Kafka Streams has taken care of those things. Um, and then we have also those tasks that are our units of parallelism that can be, can be executed, executed in parallel. Um, and what it basically means is, well, every time we get, a, we get an input topic, an input record in a topic, we are, we are consuming it, we are piping it through the data flow program, and then we append the output records to the corresponding output topic. Um, to go into a, to a little bit more details, and that is something I mentioned before already, so, so internally, Kafka Streams is using the, the, the Kafka consumer, and the Kafka producer client libraries that are also shipping with, Kafka, uh, with Apache Kafka. So we're just a higher level abstraction. And for, for state stores or for, to store state or tables, we use RocksDB internally. So it's, a, so it's an embedded key value store. Um, with, uh, it's written in, in for, it's from Facebook, it's written in C++. There might even have been talk about that, I'm not sure. We had Rockset, not RocksDB. Okay, yeah, okay, but they also build on rocks. Sure, yeah, right? of course, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, uh, and so, and so the important part is here really that again, Kafka Streams now inherits a couple of properties from the underlying clients, especially the consumer clients. So the consumer clients um, have a feature that is called a consumer group. So you can deploy multiple of those consumers at the same time, and they're getting aware of each other, and then they can do load balancing. Uh, and making and 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 they also uh, give you fault tolerance. So those consumers need to heartbeat on a regular basis. Um, and if uh, if a consumer dies, so if a new consumer joins the group, then the partition assignment of the input topic partitions to the corresponding consumers is recomputed. 
And we always ensure that every partition is assigned to exactly one consumer. Uh, and that allows us to give to, to process stuff in, in, in parallel. And the other important part is here that, as you can see here, we, we create four tasks here. And we create four tasks here because we have four partitions. So we always have this one-to-one -one mapping. A partition maps to a task. Um, and also our state that we are maintaining for the table. This state is also sharded. So here we see four state stores. Each state store will be its own RocksDB. Um, and that is associated with the task. And so when we, when we need to move task around for scaling or for tolerant, tolerance, then we have those units of, of parallelism and the corresponding shard of state that we can move around together with the input partition. And here we also see that we're running with like two threads. Uh, and so a thread can execute one or multiple tasks. Um, and that is our, our whole execution and, and parallelism model. What is now also important is, um, as I mentioned, let's say you, you do an aggregation and your data is partitioned by a certain attribute in your schema, but you want to ad, uh, aggregate by something else. So for this case, you need to repartition data because when we do the aggregation, we want to compute it locally in a single task. So we need to make sure that all records with the same grouping attribute are landing into the same task. So we must write them into the same partition. So for this case, we actually split up topologies into subtopologies. And those subtopologies are now connected via topics. So they don't interact with each other directly, uh, but they only exchange data again via Kafka topics. So you would have an upstream, to, uh, an upstream topology so that is maybe applying a filter, removing some unnecessary fields. And then it's using the grouping attribute to, to redistribute the data and write into the intermediate topic. And then the downstream uh, topology can just consume one partition, and now it knows that all records with the same grouping attribute are in this partition, and they can just compute the aggregation of this particular uh, uh, grouping attribute uh, group uh, locally uh, and update their corresponding state. Um, and that has very nice properties because the, the, the point is that those, those uh, partitions or topics, intermediate topics that we use for repartitioning. So they're basically infinite buffers. So we don't have to handle problems like back pressure or stuff like that. If something is slower downstream, upstream can still process and just write into the Kafka topic. Kafka will buffer everything. Um, and then later on, we can catch up. And another important thing is here, when we, when we update the state, so what we will always do, we will create a, a dedicated topic in the Kafka cluster. Um, to write all the changes of the state into this topic partition. And that makes the state that we maintain in the, in the KSQL DB server kind of ephemeral um, because we can always recreate it um, from the corresponding changelog topic that is stored reliably in the Kafka cluster because there it's replicated and highly available. So here we are playing against kind of idea of stream table duality to say, well, we do those local updates in RocksDB but we also push everything out into the changelog topic. Um, and if we need to recreate state, we reread the changelog topic that is hopefully aggressively compacted so we don't reload state uh, for, for recovery. So this is the, the high level uh, architecture here. And then of course, output data is also written into output topics. Um, and having this, this four tolerance mechanism with, with, with changelog topics, um, gives us a couple of other things we can actually do with it. So if we, if we say we, we execute a part of a query in machine one and machine one fails, and we need to migrate the state to machine seven and reread the changelog topics, that could take a lot of time. So we would not be highly available. But what we can actually do is we can actually say we, we deploy a hot standby on machine seven. So while the query is executing machine one, and we are writing the changes into the changelog topic, we can actually eagerly read the changelog topic at machine seven and pre-populate a copy of the state on the side. So now when machine one fails, we can immediately fail over to machine seven without any downtime because machine seven has already a copy of the state. Um, so this is a very, uh, very, very quick failover mechanism that we have um, and that we can just build um, on, on, top of, on top of Kafka. Um, 
besides that, if we, if we have those standbys, what, what also allows us, because as, as I said in the beginning, we also allow people to do those, those, those regular queries, those state lookup queries into the state. So if we would not have hot standbys, and somebody says, give me the current value, and they want to go to machine one, but mach mach machine one is down. And machine seven takes like a minute to recover the state, or maybe even five minutes or longer. Well, they cannot, they cannot issue the queries, you know, the system becomes unavailable. But having those hot standbys, um, we can actually allow to query either on machine one or on, mach or, or on machine seven. We can also load balance those pull queries. And if people are okay with that, we can also allow them to query stale state. If I say, hey, I don't, machine one has too much overload, but a couple of queries are okay if say, you know, query states that it's like a second old, because of course machine seven would always lag a little bit behind machine one that is actually executing the query. Then we can still allow people to query machine seven and become a more scalable and unavailable system. So um, that, is, that is hot standby then for tolerance. And basically it's, it's the same thing here. And we also use the same mechanism now to, to do dynamic scaling. So we can say, well, because we, we pre-shard our state already with those tasks, even if you have a single thread executing all our tasks, when we, when we add new instances, it's easy to migrate the corresponding state um, because it's all like pre-partition anyway, um, by replaying the change log topic. Of course, one challenge here is if, especially in the scale out case, if we add a new machine, the new machine will first of all have no local state, it will have an empty disk. So what we do here actually is we, we do a two phase scale out process. So when you, when you add a new server, um, before it actually takes over any query load, we would only deploy some of those hot standby tasks. Uh, and since they will reread the changelog topics, to warm up the local states. And only after that, we will do a second phase of rebalancing where we now actually migrate the query load over so the query can execute with zero downtime. For the scaling case, of course, we don't have the problem if you have hot standbys anyway, because those hot standbys exist, so we can fail over immediately. Um, but overall, um, this uh, architecture makes uh, the whole system like elastic and we can dynamically add and remove things and so hot standbys, scaling, and fault tolerance is all the same mechanism. It's all built on this idea of change log topics that you just you know, deploy uh, and, ex uh, and exploit in, in different scenarios here. Okay, then wrapping up, I would like to point out a couple of challenges we are having and also some work in progress, what we're doing. Um, so uh, I want to highlight three uh, things that we are, we are, we are looking into. First is streaming SQL by itself. Um, we would like to you know, enrich our, our SQL dialect to be uh, more concise and to be more powerful. There's a couple of things we cannot really express at the moment um, that we would like to tackle. Um, uh, we also would like to you know, make improvements to time and operator semantics. So there's still a couple of gaps. It's kind of, yeah, we cannot express this or cannot express this, uh, that. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, we hope to, to push out uh, a lot of changes in, in 2021, actually, uh, at this end. Um, then we're also working on, on consistency guarantees. So because KSQL DB is, is inherently an asynchronous system, as we have seen. So we have those change log topics. Even if you, if you do, a, do, a, do a write into a Kafka topic, there's a delay until the query is reading it. So that goes back to your question about, about updates or inserts, Andy. So if you if allow an insert in KSQL DB for consistency reasons um, or correctness reasons, the insert would always be an append to the topic first. So if you do an insert into a table, actually you write into the topic and then we need to read it back into the materialized state. So we don't really have read after write guarantees here. So, and we have, we have ideas to use, for example, vector clocks to give more guarantees for those things where you could say, you know, you do an update on a table maybe uh, and then you can reason based on some vector clocks that we of course hide from you internally to give you a guarantee we only answer your query after your update was applied and things like that. So it's, it's a lot of interesting challenges here to use vector clocks and those you know, distributed systems. Um, and then of course, we also would like to you know, improve our, our transient query support. 
Um, at the moment, we never really focused on this, but we see, we see some interest that people want to build applications like that. Because a classic KSQL DB application was always, well, you have your upstream producers, you have your KSQL in between, and then your consumers are always reading from the Kafka topics directly. But now we're seeing more people saying, no, I don't want to talk to the Kafka at all. I just want to interact with KSQL DB. Um, and then for this case, we have those push and pull queries that I mentioned already. Um, but those are not really built at the moment for production workloads or limited, let's put it that way. So there's a lot of challenges to, to make those queries scalable uh, and also more powerful. And then also, as I just mentioned, insert, update, delete support and stuff like that. Yeah, we have it, but it's maybe not what people expect. And so we're still, you know, collecting a lot of input from, from users to, to say, you know, how do we actually would like to build an application against like a SQL DB system? Because it's so different to a relational database. And we also don't want to replace relational databases. So sometimes you also say, you know, no, that's not a use case we will ever support, you know, just use your Postgres, MySQL server, or actually whatever you want to. Um, but there are a lot of use cases where it's actually just like, let's say good enough, you know, sufficient to have a KSQL DB. And then it's kind of, why do I need to, you know, export all the data into a relational database system in addition to build my application? And so there's a lot of use cases that we actually think we can serve here. Um, and yeah, we're still figuring out how far we can push those things and then become a real stream relational system. Um, because at the moment, this kind of relational part, it's there, but it's, you know, it's not a database. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And then future work, what I personally have in mind and hope we can do at some point is look into query optimization. That's of course, of course very interesting. As I said, currently we have a, a very simple rule-based optimizer that is doing some, some filter push down. We apply a couple of physical optimizations. So for example, if we need to repartition data twice, we don't create two repartition topics, but we only do it once. But it was not there in very old versions where we primitively, you know, create multiple of those repartition topics. Um, so when we have an output table, for example, um, as I said, for, for, for table state, we always create a change log topic. Um, but if we write the change log also into an output topic, we also get two topics here. So we can merge those topics together and use the output topic as, as for fault tolerance and recovery and things like that. We do this already for input topics, for output topics, it's not implemented yet. Um, and then of course, at the moment, Rule-based optimization is nice, but could we actually have a streaming cost model and a cost-based optimizer? Um, might be super interesting. Uh, a big challenge here is we don't have any statistics on our data at all. Because, I mean, most topics are populated by upstream applications. Kafka itself does not collect any statistics, and it also cannot really because it doesn't know anything about the schema of the data. Um, so there's a lot of challenges how we could do this, and then of course, because we have long, run, long, long running queries, adaptive reoptimization at the runtime is going to be a big, a big part at some point. Where we, you know, also when we deploy multiple queries, we would like to merge and split queries dynamically and stuff like that to share load, to share state. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be done in the future. Um, also, runtime improvements, there's a lot to do here. Um, so at the moment, we, we support multiple data formats like JSON or Afro. And whatever the input topics uses, we basically use also for all our intermediate state. And then we need to serialize and deserialize and all those kind of things. So the idea would be actually, maybe we only want to have JSON and Afro on the input and output topics. And then we translate it into a more efficient internal data format that we use in our changelog topics and repartition topics and in our rocks DBs um, to be much more efficient. So there's also a lot of, lot of interesting, interesting questions how we could do this. Um, and also the task assignment problem. Um, because tasks in our case are, are stateful, um, we have this problem to preserve load balancing, but at the same time with, with standby tasks and stuff like that, we also want to be sticky. If you have a standby, we don't want to assign this task somewhere else for, cost, uh, for failover, but we want to reuse the state. And so we have to balance uh, the, the, the load balancing and stickiness, and maybe even say, while we have a current deployment, but we know it's unbalanced. So we want to lazily, you know, migrate state in the background in order to get to a balanced assignment later on. Um, and so this task assignment problem is, is, is a big one as well. Um, and then for, for SQL, looking into subqueries might also be very interesting because we have this abstraction of streams and tables. It's a little bit unclear how subqueries should actually execute and what the semantics of those actually are 
because in SQL standard, well, subqueries are well defined over tables, but now we have this stream thing. So it's a little bit unclear how we should actually handle those things. Okay, with this, a um, couple of references. So if you're interested in that, so there are two papers that we could publish um, at, uh, at EDPT and, and at the Bridge Workshop. And so more books and papers about Kafka can be found on the Apache Kafka website. And of course, I want to invite you to check out KSQLDB at ksqldb.io. And one last sentence is, if that's interesting, we are hiring, not just this year, hopefully also next year, for the ksqldb team and Kafka teams. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have now. Okay, awesome. I'll, I'll applaud on behalf of everyone else. All right, uh, we have time for one or two questions from the audience, if anybody has something to ask Matthias. Okay, so the Kafka stream stuff, that's, that's actually doing some computation, right? That, or that is all the computation, but there's certain things that you want to express in KSQL DB or KSQL that cannot be expressed in Kafka streams. So you almost like you run them as like lambdas or whatever, right? Instead of Kafka, instead of Kafka streams, is that correct? Um, well, I mean, Kafka streams is always the runtime. And at the moment, um, we have not found anything in KSQL DBs that we cannot do. Um, okay. But there's always the possibility also in Kafka streams to actually implement custom operators. Okay. So if that ever occurs, then KSQL DB would implement its custom operator, plug it into the data flow, and would just be happy. So yeah. that's a, certainly possible. And then you guys don't support indexes because... You know, Not at the moment. So it's also something we would like to look into, especially for our pull query support. Yeah. And say, you know, well, I have this table. At the moment, RocksDB is indexing it on the primary key, obviously. Yeah. So, so lookups are efficient. But if now people start to query with, with other things, then yeah, maybe we want to build in disease. But then again, the problem, because everything is async comes into play, how do we actually do this? I mean, you don't just fake it now, because if you, if you make a whatever continuous query table that's sorted by whatever you want to join, right, then right, you get it for free that way in some ways. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, but at the moment, we, we limit those queries really for primary key lookups, because that's ah, the only okay. thing we can execute efficiently. But we can then say, okay, if you don't have an index, we just do a primitive like RocksDB full scan. That's going to be hell slow, but at least we can execute it. Yep. And so the next step would be, oh, actually, we can also allow you a create index statement. And then we would, you know, repartition the data, materialize it a second time, stuff like that. Yep. But then the main challenge is really how do we keep the index and the table in sync? Yep. And then uh, DDL changes is, is, it, is it even bigger nightmare in your world too. And presumably you don't support add drop column, right? Say again, we don't support. You don't you don't support add drop column like like alter table. No, no, not at the moment. That's also something we would like to we'd like to into. Um, so what we actually support is a, is a, is a, is, a, is an up an, an update statement. Um, so create or replace basically for a table. Um, mm -hmm. where we allow certain changes to the underlying queries that is populating the result stream or table. But that is, of course, also quite difficult to say, you know, how do you do, you do this in a backward compatible manner? Yeah. I mean, adding a filter or something like that is always easy. But if you start to, you know, change the columns you have or stuff like that, it's, it's actually pretty complicated. Got it. All right, my last question is, um, what, is the, what was the starting point for your SQL dialect? Was it just, did you take the Postgres, you know, the grammar file or, or did you guys write one, write one from scratch? Uh, no, we started with Presto. Mr. Oh, Presto, okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we just modified it accordingly. Of course, yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Matthias, I thank you so much for doing this. This is super enlightening. And this is definitely different than a different way to think about databases. And hopefully, the students understand like, oh, streaming is a, is a total, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's a different beast, especially with all those temporal semantics yes. that are really giving us a hard time. Um, and everything is distributed in asynchrone and um, means super interesting to work on. Yes. Um, and so, so let's see how far we can, we can push this, but it, it's for sure a different beast. Yes, awesome, thank you.